my name is Yuan Dongtian. Uh, I'm a research scientist and a manager in Facebook AI research. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, our recent work on learning to optimize high dimensional optimization problems. So uh, my main research direction is basically reinforcement learning. So I think people have already heard about reinforcement learning. I, uh, and uh, in the past few uh, years, uh, what people actually see is there's a big success by applying reinforcement learning and showing it. And maybe, and also like, uh, we also see like a good progress and uh, super performance in Dota 2 and StarCraft 2. And uh, in poker, uh, which uh, is an imperfect information game, we also see like uh, with similar technique, we can see a strong performance. So uh, people might wonder, what is beyond games? So in this paper, uh, in this talk, we actually uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, how we can apply IR, reinforcement learning, to uh, black box optimization problems uh, so that uh, we see interesting, nice performance gains. And uh, uh, so for this problem, so what is beyond the game for reinforcement learning? We actually see there's already like uh, interesting results from Google that Google actually teaches AI to play the game of the chip design. So you can actually use uh, the same technique uh, to basically like find uh, the good um, chip alignment and basically like a design in the, in the chip so that uh, you can basically have this agent that uh, design a chip for you automatically. So it turns like several weeks with human experts in the loop to a full automatic system that can be uh, runnable in six hours and you will get like a, a comparable uh, design that is uh, on the on par with uh, human performance, even with uh, super, even human experts. So inspired by that, it's actually a very interesting and nice um, uh, show as to see that we actually have an IR that can do something that is beyond games, right? So in this talk, I'm talking a little bit about uh, our recent work that apply IR for uh, black box optimization. So uh, this is a slide basically showing what is black box optimization. So uh, in black box optimization, you actually try to optimize a, a function, which is called a black box function fx. And you try to find uh, the minimum of that function or maximum of the function, right? So uh, of this, uh, of this uh, black box optimization, using this black box optimization. So uh, the hardest part of this thing is uh, this f function is not known uh, beforehand. And you have no idea what is the structure. It can have lots of arbitrary structures there. It might be super hard, super uh, slow to evaluate, right? And uh, it might be super expensive to evaluate. But in the goal here is trying to find an efficient optimization technique so that you get uh, the highest performance. I mean, you basically get the lowest possible uh, values uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the function and with the fewest function cost. Okay. Is the usage of this uh, specific domain, right? So this is actually applicable to almost any systems. So uh, for example, I mean, for any system that you can think about, for example, you are designing a recommendation system, uh, and then there's a bunch of hyperparameters you want to tune, right? So in order to find the best combination of hyperparameters, in order to get the best performance, I mean, it's uh, there's actually a hard problem. If you treat this entire system as a black box, and it takes many days to get its performance back. Right? So you get, you tune some parameters, you set them up and then let it run. Let it run for a few days. And then after a few days, you get some numbers. Uh, you guess, oh, the performance is getting better, or getting worse, but they take some time to get things back. Big problem of, uh, uh, of basically the black optimization problem is uh, the function evaluation is actually pretty slow. Right? So then like the question is like whether we can uh, get the highest performance with the fewest function call. Right? So this is actually a, a big problem for the traditional reinforcement technique uh, in which you need like a lot of data uh, to get uh, the, the good performance uh, for an agent to uh, act reasonably. So if you check back to the uh, previous like uh, the Go paper or the like Alpha Go paper or Alpha Zero Go Zero paper, what happens is uh, I mean we need to basically use like a thousand of GPUs in order to uh, collect all the data, all these informations uh, from scratch 
And then with all this like a million or tens of million of uh, games, then you can train the models so, so that the model performs well uh, in, in, in situations, and which is also in the same uh, goal domain. Right. So, but in platform optimization, what happens is that you cannot afford to evaluate uh, to to use this uh, environment uh, a very in, in like a, in a million of times so that you get the data. Right. So then it will be highly impractical. Right. So in that case, uh, can we still use the reinforcement learning to to do that? Right. That's actually like one big problem. So this is basically the simple inefficiency uh, problem for this reinforcement learning kind of setting. So uh, in this thing, I'm uh, basically like uh, mainly discuss and introduce our work, which is the latent space medical tree search. Uh, so this is actually a very simple, efficient way to find uh, the solution, uh, the, the optimization, the optimizer of uh, these optimization problems. Right. So in this uh, direction, we have been publishing two papers. Uh, one is uh, the last year's that that we basically apply this technique. Uh, for black hole optimization. And we show that the performance is actually a lot better uh, than uh, many evolution approaches, as well as uh, other uh, kind of existing black hole optimization approaches uh, in different domains, including artificial synthetic functions, as well as real scenarios. And then the second paper is uh, recently get accepted uh, in uh, the IEEE uh, transaction on pattern analysis and machine intelligence. Uh, this is uh, like a very prestigious journal with an impact factor of 17. And uh, in that paper, we're actually using, uh, we're using the same technique for uh, architecture search, which is basic aim for to search, aim to like uh, search the, the right architecture of a neural network so that its performance reached a very uh, strong uh, level uh, given a data set. So this is uh, some uh, very empirical and uh, very uh, useful technique that people can use in their specific domain. For example, if you want to search a network architecture for a specific usage, right? So I mean, we cannot afford uh, to have humans to actually design that by hand, but we can actually use architecture search uh, to find the, the right architecture uh, so that uh, to automate the entire process. So first of all, I just want to uh, give you like uh, the overview of this project. And the first is the, the code is public, and uh, uh, you guys can uh, can use it. Uh, and it's free. It's a spoken source, and uh, you can basically click into it. And then uh, there's a very simple tutorials, follow tutorials, and things uh, you can just uh, uh, use it. Uh, so uh, feel free to use our code base. And uh, one thing that I want to notice, uh, I want to say is, uh, I mean, this uh, same algorithm is being used uh, by the SERS, the SERS team and ACE team in the New York 2020 Black Box Optimization Competition, which has happened just at the end of last year. And uh, both of the teams actually uh, use our approach, uh, but they re-implemented the entire uh, system rather than using our code, because at that time, our code hasn't been released yet. And they got like a pretty good uh, places, uh, pretty 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 good uh, places. And uh, I mean uh, the total number of competition, total number of uh, teams that is competing in this uh, competition is like uh, uh, thirty to performance. Okay, so uh, so here's like an example of showing how uh, this uh, algorithm we are to. Right, so here, supposedly, we are optimizing a black box function called the accurate 2D and accurate 20D. So accurate function is a function that is synthetic. It's basically constructed by mathematicians uh, so that to test uh, the performance of a black box optimizer. Right, so uh, if you're on front of these 2D images, you can see that uh, it has a unique optimal, which is at zero. Uh, this is group optimal. And, but it also has a lot of bumps. Uh, around this global optimal in order to test the performance of different optimization uh, techniques, right? So uh, the, in the, the, for this slide to the right, you actually see uh, there's um, a very clear comparison uh, between uh, our approach and, uh, and our approach plus, uh, uh, plus uh, Bayesian uh, optimization versus like uh, Bayesian optimization alone without our approach. So you'll see that I mean, the, the, our sample complexity is much higher uh, then if you use the uh, base optimization alone, right? So our approach is shown in the in the blue, while uh, the base optimization approach is shown in in, in in orange. 
right? So you see that our approach actually uh, drops the function uh, faster compared uh, with the same number of samples. Okay. Yeah, so this two axis is basically like the y axis is the, the decreasing function values and x axis is like the, the number of function calls. So with more function calls, we expect that the, the function value will be decreased uh, faster uh, because, uh, I mean, this function value is basically plotted as the, the slowest, the smallest function value, the best function value so far after you have made uh, uh, that many function calls. All right, so, I mean, obviously that curve will be monotonic decreasing, uh, but uh, we just want to see whether our curve can be decreasing faster, which means that the search is much more, much more efficient uh, compared to uh, existing baselines. So this is basically like simple usage of uh, this, uh, uh, this, this code base. Uh, so you, what you need to do is just to define a single function and you're ready to go, that's it. Uh, so very simple. So you basically write a class, a Python class, and then you uh, write a, a function like the, the called the call, and then that function take into uh, the, the high dimensional input, uh, which is basically the parameter of uh, your black box function and uh, the function uh, that will return, this function will return the function, the function value of that, uh, that input, right? And then you can basically wrap this entire my function uh, into our uh, software and, uh, by, and specifying like a upper bound, lower bound of each of these uh, parameters you want to optimize, as well as a few bunch of uh, parameters. And then you just let that run and uh, it will give you the, the, the best uh, 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 the best parameter that will optimize the function after uh, a few iterations. And you can also specify the number of iterations. That's very simple. And uh, this is another example showing that uh, for another scenario function, which is called uh, uh, 2D Rosenbrock, and our approach is also doing uh, very well uh, in terms of the same complexity. All right, uh, so with fewest number of are faster uh, than using uh, using base optimization. Okay, so uh, that's basically like the usage of uh, this, uh, this this package, and uh, you don't need to understand the, the detail of uh, the, how it works. Uh, but as long as you have any kind of usage and needs, you just uh, try it uh, and uh, and, this, and see how it works. And it, it just uh, most of the time it give you like uh, interesting results uh, with the same uh, number of function calls. Okay. And then the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to dedicate uh, this talk with um, uh, how does it work, right? So I'm um, basically for people who are interested uh, in not only using this package but also uh, try to understand why it actually does better. Uh, uh, that's the rest of the talk. So feel free to enjoy. So uh, so basically, like uh, in order to okay, let me start this second part. So in order to base, uh, make the optimization problem into uh, reinforcement learning, so the first question we want to answer is how we convert an optimization procedure, a modification problem to a Markov decision process, which is the underlying mathematical formulation uh, for reinforcement learning. Right, so a uh, previous paper has already tried that. I mean, people have already tried this direction. It's very natural to think about that. So, but previous paper, what they did is that they are trying to uh, specify a predefined action space. And then that action space can be you know, used action space to formulate this entire optimization problem as a reinforcement problems. This is very natural for games. Uh, for example, for the, for the game like a Go, and what happens is, uh, I mean, it's a very, it has a very well-defined rules. Uh, so you have to uh, follow the rules to play the game. Right? So for every situation you have, uh, for example, in 19 by 19 Go board, uh, you basically uh, find a position of the ball and put place a stone there. Right? So that's a very well-defined action space. And uh, in optimization, people have already tried that as well. They, they manually define the action space uh, uh, so that you can apply reinforcement learning. Right? So uh, for example, when doing new architecture search, so what happens is, uh, I mean, we can define action space like uh, first, you have to set up the number of filters then set up like a, how the height of the filters, width of the filters, and the height of the stride, width, width of stride, and so on. And then you uh, fix the, this uh, first layer, and uh, the first layer specification of the parameters has been fixed. Then you go to the next layer, etc. Right. So uh, that's actually kind of natural in terms of uh, uh, reinforcement learning kind of settings. But people might wonder if you think deeper, 
we actually will come up with a kind of different uh, conclusion, like why we want to define uh, predefined actions by the humans, right? Because we are dealing with optimization problems. We are not dealing with uh, actual reinforcement learning uh, settings, right? So we, it's, there's actually a, very, a lot of different ways to convert optimization problem into a reinforcement learning problem and solve it with reinforcement techniques, right? So that's basically like the, uh, the, 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 the kind of meta question. So in, in this, along this direction, we are actually uh, think about the right direction. We actually like uh, propose our approach that is based on learning the action space so that that action space is best suited for this optimization problems. Uh, that's actually the contribution in a scientific that direction that why we can actually publish these two papers in a scientific uh, uh, a venue and show that it has scientific values. Uh, basically uh, bring about like a new knowledge and new kind of insights for these hard problems. Right? In order to, for us to actually see why uh, learning action space is uh, important and why different action space is actually different uh, for the optimization problems. Here's a one of very concrete examples. Right, so here we are focusing on architecture search. So we have a space of all the architectures. And uh, in this space, uh, we are varying different parameters of the architecture, uh, yielding uh, 1,364 networks. And the goal here is trying to find a network that best or with the best accuracy. Uh, with uh, uh, so that's the, the that's the goal, right? So the space is small because uh, we are using a toy example, but uh, in a real setting, the space can be huge, right? So in that case, like how can we find the network with the best accuracy ever, with the fewest number of trials? That will be the the the, the best. Uh, uh, that will be the goal of the, of the, of this of, of, of this optimization, right? So here we are trying two different action spaces. The first one is called sequential action space. This is a similar, very similar to the previous slides, right? So we first, uh, uh, we basically build a network one layer after another, right? So for each layer, we first add one layer and set its kernel size as well as the channel size. And then we set another layer, set the channel kernel size and as well as, well as the channel size, etc. cetera. To do this is sequentially until we say, okay, let's stop. And uh, we just use a network as a network we want to try and see how it works. But alternatively, we have another way of constructing the action space in order to construct the network. Now we first set the depth, how deep the network is. And then uh, given the depth, we set all the kernel size as well as the channel size and so on, right? So this is a very simple change of the setting of the problem. And uh, we can see that this simple change of setting problem actually leads to a much different, very different like behavior in terms of the semi complexity, right? So if you take a look at the right figure, so, so this is the figure that we're familiar with. So, right? The x axis the number of samples uh, we have already tried. So each sample here is representing a network. And then uh, for each network, in order to obtain uh, its performance, uh, you need to train a, total, train a network from scratch. And then you get the performance. So, so it's very expensive. Right? So and then our goal is trying to uh, minimize, uh, try to see like we get, we can get like a, uh, we use like few samples ever. And at the same time, the accuracy can go 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 to the like a top go to the top as soon as possible, right? So we can see that with this global action space, uh, it's actually uh, much faster uh, in terms of this uh, uh, this uh, accuracy growth compared to the sequential uh, accuracy sequential action space, right? So you can see that, that this is a clear difference uh, between these two action spaces, which is pretty interesting, right? So the underlying reason is that uh, I mean the the depth is actually much much more important in order uh, in order to determine the, uh, the the performance of the network, right? So that's actually a very important uh, part, right? So and uh, we actually make that decision first, and that decision actually uh, efficiently prune the action space so that uh, we only focus on the most important ones. Okay. Yeah. So uh, and uh, so. And in the previous slides, so we already showed that different action space actually play a very different roles. But now uh, we are trying to move one step further. That's that basically say, okay, uh, instead of like enumerating all the possible action spaces that is designed by human, how about we learn the action space by ourselves, right? So this is actually a very interesting research problem because that's something that people have never thought about. And uh, by learning action space, what I mean here is uh, you still have this kind of like search tree, right? But that search tree 
uh, will be in some sense like a training and semantic meanings uh, when we are learning action spaces. So uh, the, 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 the problem here is that, uh, so here's like an example of tic-tac-toe, right? So uh, in, in tic-tac-toe, it's not possible because uh, we basically know the meaning of each of these uh, actions, right? So some action corresponds to you place a stone at the center, some action corresponds to place a stone at the corners. But in optimization problems, we actually can try to change the meanings of all these edges, right? So that uh, these um, modified meanings can actually facilitate our optimizations. So in our work, how we can learn the action space, so we actually define a new, uh, find a, a way to define this action space. Right? So uh, here, this is basically a figure showing what is the meaning of that. So uh, this, in, this entire rectangle is basically the space of the entire search, uh, the entire like, search space. So here we're talking about architecture search, which means that every small little point uh, when architectures, okay. So, and you basically have a bunch of architectures in this space and you want to find what is the best one, right? This space can be large, super huge. And uh, in this kind of settings, the, the action, action space become like the partition of this, uh, uh, this search space, right? So you might uh, partition this entire space into different regions. And uh, each region, whether you pick left region or right region, actually becomes your, your action, your, your selections in this search tree. So that's the definition of this action space. Okay. So then like the criteria, then like the question becomes like, uh, what will be the criteria for us to pick the, the what is the best action space we can think about? Right. So uh, in order to uh, achieve that, so one thing that we want to, we want to check is um, um, what is the difference between this global action space and the sequential action space, right? We know the global action space is better. Why? So if we plot the, the, the figure, uh, the, basically the, the branching of this search tree in this two action space, as well as uh, the performance at every like uh, leaf node in this uh, branching of the search tree, you actually see a very nice patterns in uh, the global action space, right? So in the global action space, you see that the, the good uh, neural networks that is uh, the, the, the leaf that are basically like a pretty dark, right, darkish, blue darkish. They are actually clustered together into one branch of the action uh, of the search space. While like the bad neural networks that is shown as uh, uh, as this white, whitish, uh, blue, uh, whitish color, they are actually also clustered into another branch of the action space, uh, of the search space, right? So uh, basically, like the good action space can actually efficiently partition uh, the good uh, network were from the from the bad networks. I mean, separate these two, uh, very uh, in a very kind of like clear manner. So this is actually good because um, uh, you actually uh, can focus your search towards the region that are very promising. Right. So in contrast, if you check the action space uh, from the sequential setting, so what you see is things are kind of set around. Right. So you have uh, uh, the search tree here. And you, what you see is, uh, uh, you see like the good action, the good uh, uh, neural network and the bad neural network, they are actually in the same tree. Right? So, uh, and they are basically like a scattered around. So in the, for this kind of action uh, space, in order to achieve the very good network or very good solutions, trees, tree branches, and to their leaves, so that uh, uh, you have to check every branches, every leaves in order to get the best performance. So definitely the performance or the, uh, or the search efficiency is definitely not as good as the global uh, version of it. Right. So uh, given, inspired by this example, then what happens is uh, we, we now know like how can we actually uh, design and learn action space automatically from data, right? So that's actually very simple. So uh, we basically like, a, uh, lay down all the uh, all the good and the bad uh, samples that we already collected, right? So in this figure, so we have a, a very simple two-dimensional uh, search space. And in this two-dimensional search space, suppose we already have searched a few architectures, right? Some of them are very good. Like for example, this one, they get 98% of accuracy. Some of them are super bad as they get 10% of accuracy. Right, so and we lay down all these uh, uh, existing samples, and then we try to learn a classifier that can separate the good one versus the bad ones. Right, you can use a linear classifier, you can use SVN, whatever things you like, and uh, you, once you have this uh, partition, 
then you can construct the two actions, which is we call the latent action. So one is the left one, and the other is the right one. Whereas the left action will basically uh, move you towards like the good regions, and the right action will move you towards the bad regions, and etc. Right. So that then like you have you already have defined uh, the action spaces in this uh, in this domain, and then you can do this intuitively. You can basically construct this tree, which is a hierarchical tree that uh, intuitively separate the region from good, uh, the good from bad. Right. And you can also use a nonlinear boundary uh, learned by SVM. Right. So and you basically construct this tree. Now, that's basically how uh, things work. Okay. But people might wonder, okay, why we want to uh, construct a tree? People may say, okay, maybe we just focus on the good regions. The good regions is good. Why we still want to spend time and efforts on the bad regions? The, the interesting part here is that the bad regions is actually not that bad because uh, we define good regions and bad regions depend on the samples uh, drawn from these two regions. But these samples can may have a lot of biases, right? So you might not get sufficient samples in order to uh, to 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 do this uh, uh, to to set to 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 basically learn this action space very uh, very accurately. So we need to still keep these bad regions in order uh, for uh, many car tree search to explore these regions in order to straw, straw, uh, still get the good samples out. So then like the entire uh, algorithm actually goes to these two stages. The first stage is basically given the initial uh, samples, try to learn the action space. Right? This is this, this B step of B. And once you have this action space, then you actually search using this learn action space using uh, many car tree search. Okay, so the good thing about many car tree search is uh, it exploit uh, the good regions, but at the same time, it also explore uh, regions that are seems to be bad, uh, but may have potentials in the future, right? So once we basically then it balanced the exploration versus exploitation. So once we have more data from many car tree search, then we train we retrain this action space again and repeat this entire procedure until uh, our budgets of uh, uh, calling that functions uh, is being deprecated. Okay, we basically have to do this intuitively and two convergence. Okay. So uh, here's like a bunch of like slides talking about many car tree search. Uh, I, uh, I think uh, given the time limits, I'm not going to cover that. But uh, if people are interested, uh, please take a look at uh, the recent papers on many car tree search. It's been used extensively uh, in the game of Go and game of chess using uh, this kind of self play kind of training. So here's basically a slide uh, that I already mentioned that uh, why exploration is important. Because these good and bad uh, uh, regions, they are actually not uh, the the ground truth good and bad because they this they, these are such, uh, these are regions that is learned uh, given the current uh, samples. So we will still want to explore regions that are bad, uh, but may contain optimal solution. Okay, so uh, here's like a bunch of uh, in a few like uh, details encounter when we design these algorithms, for example, when we already reached the leaf of our search tree, then we're supposed to basically get like a one samples, right? So one uh, samples from that leaf, but each leaf or each intermediate node is essentially incorporating a sub region of the entire search space. A way to random sample at points, uh, and then you query the black box optimize uh, black box function to get this true function values, which is expensive. There are different ways of doing sampling, right? So you can basically sample uh, using uh, rejective sampling, or you might sample uh, according to um, uh, existing uh, optimiz uh, optimizers. For example, you can actually using these small regions, you can actually fit a uh, small Bayesian uh, 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 Gaussian process models. And then you find the, the optimal solutions in this Gaussian process model in re return, right? So then, like you can use that as our our approaches, the combine the approaches with any kind of uh, existing black box optimizer to actually improve the performance further. So then, in that sense, our method becomes a matcher method and can be applied to arbitrary existing approaches. So and now we come to the performance. Uh, uh, so we have shown like uh, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting uh, results, and uh, this interesting result actually motivates us to further uh, make this algorithm 
are more broad and more applicable to more situations. Uh, so we try this with uh, simple data sets. For example, uh, we have an architecture search data set that contains like 10K architectures. And we try that with our approach and as well as other, other, other approaches that people have already uh, used, for example, like uh, um, uh, based on optimization and random search. Right, so we see that our approach actually does a much good job, a much better job in terms of like uh, finding uh, the, the the best possible um, uh, architectures given the same amount of samples. And when the data set is become larger and larger, we actually show that our approach actually become like more and more effective uh, compared to the previous uh, approaches that try to find the same solutions. Okay, so we also try this uh, with open domain. Uh, we basically train this uh, network on the fly uh, whenever it gets discovered uh, by this uh, uh, by this search procedure. Right. And then we show that our approach is doing a much good job, a much better job. Uh, so a comparable job in uh, multiple city settings. We also try this uh, with the black box uh, functions. So this is the two functions I mentioned before. One is called accurate 2 d and the other is the Rosen and Brock 2 d Right, so and we actually show that with our approach, um, uh, if we combine our approach with existing solvers like base optimization or Tubo, Tubo is one of the very nice approaches that is proposed by Uber, and uh, we actually show that our approach actually can substantially improve their efficiencies, uh, especially for high dimensional optimization problems. Okay, so for the uh, the basically like all these curves, the uh, the solid lines. Uh, basically our approaches right so and you see like our approaches is like dropping this curve faster uh, compared to existing original approaches that is uh, shown in the dotted lines okay we also try this uh, with um, um, uh, with uh, uh, with optimizing this uh, linear policies for Mojoko tasks and we see that when the dimension of the of the uh, problems become higher and higher our approaches actually does a very good job and achieving higher and higher rewards compared to the um, evolution approaches. Uh, so as we have compared in this figure. Okay. And of course, there's a bunch of limitations in these approaches because, uh, for example, in particular, uh, for this uh, 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 for these Mojoko tasks, when you see this, like this task is actually very smooth. So the, the function is actually super smooth and uh, you don't actually need uh, a lot of explorations. Uh, so you can just follow green descent and actually give you reasonable performance. Uh, so uh, we actually did outside the experiment. We actually show that I mean, if you do green descent, it's actually doing better. Uh, actually, uh, after if you actually compare with a bunch of uh, reinforcement approaches, right? So, uh, but uh, we we still want to emphasize that uh, this is actually a very nice approaches, uh, especially if your problem is uh, highly non-convex and contain a lot of uh, simple mode, uh, a lot of a lot of modes that has local optimals, and this approach is actually doing well. Uh, especially if the approaches, uh, if your of the function is not uh, uh, convex or not differentiable, then uh, our approaches can uh, give you a very nice property and very nice results. And finally, we also uh, apply these approaches to multi-objective optimizations. So in that case, there could be multiple uh, objectives that you want to optimize at the same time. So in that case, like the goal now becomes like a, to maximize the hyper volume of this plateau frontier, right? So you might have two quantities uh, that you want to optimize at the same time. Then what you want to do is you want to find this plateau frontier so that this region is uh, the volume of this region is maximized. Right. So, and we actually show very good performance, uh, comparable or even better performance uh, compared to the existing approaches, uh, which is called the QEVHI, uh, EHVI, which is actually also a, a nice uh, newer paper uh, last year uh, by uh, Facebook as well. And we show that uh, our approach is uh, slightly better uh, than uh, these existing approaches. And uh, thanks for the attention. And this is basically the talk that I'm delivering. And uh, I will leave uh, 10 minutes uh, for question and answering. Any questions?
Um, so till now we don't have any questions in the live uh, chat or in the live.odc.com as well. Um, since we have time, we can wait for a few minutes. Yeah. So any questions to come? Um, we have a question from Sherry. Mm -hmm. um, hi, thank you so much, Yuan Dong, for the seminar. I would want to ask about other applications of optimized problems, like other than games. Do you think this could be applied to financial area diversification or asset allocation? I think uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think because uh, our approach is for uh, black box optimization, so it can apply to any situation that you have a black box function that will return a number given a set of uh, hyperparameters, right? So it doesn't really depend on like what specific domain uh, you are applying that to. Uh, so I mean, I mean, it's uh, it could be interesting to apply to all these uh, fields. I mean, if you can be a uh, if you can be more specific about uh, what are the problems that you want to address, I, I think I can give you maybe more detailed answers. Um, so looks like we don't have any more questions from the audience. Um, we have around six minutes left. So if you want to say something. Um, I want to say like, I think that's a nice uh, research direction and uh, if people and also it's very empirical and uh, people can actually use that uh, for a lot of uh, many situations. So if you have any questions, any any kind of like uh, issues in the usage. Uh, okay, someone is asking questions about uh, the travel salesman problem. I'm not sure whether this is the case. Yeah, so if you have any question, any usage issues, then you can apply that to, uh, you can try to open issues in the GitHub. And uh, we will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, okay, so we have actually have a bunch of more questions. 
Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, first of all, I think this can be used for travel salesman problems, sure, but uh, for travel salesman problem, you might have a better solutions for that because there's a lot of uh, existing solvers for travel salesman problems. Uh, you definitely can try it and see uh, which one is better. Uh, so for travel salesman problems, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure whether how to parameterize that. We haven't tried that yet, but you can take a look. And another question I have uh, is that, um, uh, thanks for the talk, Yuan Dong. So this approach uh, stacks a linear classifier on top of black hole function. Oh, actually, no, it's not the case. Um, so the linear classifier is actually inside uh, the uh, our uh, black box uh, optimizer. Right. So in this black box optimizer, what happens is you basically partition the space into small regions, and the partition is specified as a linear classification. You can you can basically change this linear classification with other things. So we can use a non-linear classification. You can use whatever things you want to partition the space. So this is not a, a, a stack a linear classifier on top of a black box function. It's basically you are using a linear classifier, you know, whatever classifier to partition the space uh, of uh, search. And then uh, you basically, you can use whatever classifier you have and that. So I don't think that there's any, uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, issue with imbalance or, or bias. Uh, so maybe you can, you can elaborate on top uh, a little bit on that. So uh, I, I don't know what, what do you mean by uh, imbalance and or bias. Okay, uh, okay. there's a follow-up question from uh, Sherry Pentian. Uh, so uh, she said, uh, so a search allocation as like we want to maximize the return or minimize the risk based on historical data or price and returns, a series stocks with time series, et cetera. Yeah, I think uh, definitely you can try that. Uh, so, but for all this, uh, usually black box optimization is the last assort, right? So, last resource. If you cannot find anything else, then you can try black box optimization. But if you already have a very efficient optimizer, then maybe you can try these things first. Maybe that is more performance specific and can be used uh, uh, first. So, I mean, for sure, for your cases, definitely you can try it. You, you only need, what you only need to do is you basically specify uh, what is the input? Uh, so for this, for this black box function, what is the parameter that uh, will specify? Uh, well, uh, you, you, the parameter you want to send into this function, and uh, what will be the output uh, of the uh, of the function? And you, once you specify this input output, and you can use that, uh, you can basically uh, actually can, uh, uh, define that function, and you call our uh, black box optimizer. And hopefully that will give you good solutions.